Dear guests and parents, dear family members and friends, welcome to Stanford. Dear faculty and Stanford Law School staff, good to see you, and more importantly, thank you. Distinguished NSA officials, the slight hissing sound from the microphone, the slight hissing sound from the microphone tells me that you're here. I'm glad that you could make it. Please, the NSA assured me that they only tap this microphone, that they only observe guests that eat foreign food, wear foreign clothes, speak foreign languages, or ever travel to a foreign country. <laughs> to all Americans, you're not affected, the official said. <laughs> to all the foreigners, feel special, someone is listening to you. <laughs> Class of 2014, congratulations. You have accomplished great things and you deserve appreciation. But first, let me take a selfie. <laughs> please, 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 this is business. This is for my new startup, Spelfy, featuring speech selfies. I am confident, I am confident of attracting 2 billion users by December and creating profits by 2040. <laughs> My fellow classmates, you have mastered exams, written countless papers, and deserve appreciation. LLMs, you even did that in a foreign language, especially harsh for our classmates from New Zealand and Ireland. <laughs> You have volunteered in community projects, worked in student associations, contributed to law journals, participated in a talent show and a musical. All this besides your demanding legal studies. You have picked up new sports, continued your lifetime passions, and explored the beautiful state of California. To all the internationals, you have had countless first times visiting football games, seeing snow in the mountains, drinking root beer, playing golf, capsizing sailboats, <laughs> attending a rodeo, experiencing a government shutdown, <laughs> paying tuition fees, <laughs> and having teachers that actually know your names a fact that in other countries would tell you that you had done something wrong. <laughs> All this in one year, be proud of your accomplishments. Adapting to a new culture is challenging. It is hard to transfer from a legal system in which doctrine is everything and reality nothing, to one in which an empirical study may be the holy grail and doctrine seems to be the 17 ounce soda to Michael Bloomberg. <laughs> And other things are different here, too. I grew up in a country where trend is a word in fashion, standing for tailored shirts and slim fit pants. And then moved to an area in which trend means innovation, created in tank tops and jogging pants. <laughs> we came from regions where Facebook was cool to a place where it was popular in nursing homes. <laughs> Yet, in the end, all of this did not matter because Stanford is not about where you came from, but where you want to be. Stanford is a mindset and a feeling and a statement that is global. Some time into the program, many of us LLMs decided to stay longer than originally intended. Even though I didn't do well in evidence, I am sure this is non-assertive conduct which does not constitute hearsay and is admissible to prove how amazing this place is. Many of you, 
found great career opportunities, and realized your personal American dream. By the way, if anyone is interested, my startup, Spelfi, still needs funding. <laughs> Two million should be enough to cover office space in the city and cocktail parties for two years. <laughs> but returning to more serious topics, Stanford has been outstanding. For one of my classes, we received an email announcing that there would be, and I quote, a Q&A session with a senior US executive branch policymaker. So what would you expect? A general counsel from a government agency? Maybe a deputy secretary, since there were security measures mentioned in the email? Well, this is Stanford Law School. It turned out that our guest was former President George W. Bush, accompanied by Professor Condoleezza Rice, both down for an informal chat on foreign policy. Looking back, I should have gotten suspicious when they checked me for dangerous shoes and searched me <laughs> for weapons of mass destruction at the entrance. It is, it is classes like this, and there were many, that we will never forget. Thank you for this incredible experience at the world's best law school. <laughs> Dear class of 2014, it is now time to say goodbye. Friends, I will miss the road trips, the chicken nuggets, the themed parties, the Russo burgers, the discussions in class, the friendly smiles that lit up my time here, and yes, even the late night library sessions you shared with me. To all those who are going abroad, bad news, you might have to pay for overweight baggage. <laughs> for all the friends that travel along in your hearts, to all those who stay. <laughs> to all those who stay, watch out, domestic flights have even stricter luggage limitations. <laughs> and to everyone, die Luft der Freiheit weht. Let the wind of freedom blow. Lead, inspire, innovate, and always remember your friends. Thank you. Good morning, class of 2014. I would like to especially welcome our professors, staff, family, friends, and that one guy who attends every lunch talk. <laughs> I'm sure he's here somewhere. It is a great honor to speak before you today. Final Law School Reflection Paper, number 97. <laughs> Learning to give a damn. Part one of three. What is happening to me and where are my goats? We all arrived here strangers in a strange land. New to legal analysis, new to the courtroom, new to the soulless outdoor mall that is Silicon Valley. I was perhaps stranger than most. Just three months before coming to law school, I was living in a mud house in rural Morocco. Three months before civil procedure, my name was Mbark. I spoke a language called Tamazight. And every morning outside my kitchen window, 
I could see two mountain ranges, a herd of goats, and a shepherd who called me Aromi, which means foreigner, but really it means Roman, which means foreigner, because that's just how old and isolated that place is. <laughs> it was there that I first decided to go to law school. Morocco was a rich cultural experience, but throughout my time there, I encountered people in dire straits that I had no idea how to help. I heard about villages chaining the mentally ill in their houses because they lacked services to treat them. I saw doctors soliciting bribes from the poor for vaccinations that were supposed to be free. I came to law school because I wanted to sharpen a tool I could use to help people at the margins. When I received that email from Dean Deal at a cyber cafe 25 kilometers from my village, I felt like Stanford was saying, yes, Mbark, we believe in you and what do you want to achieve? Three months later, people around me were engaging in vigorous debate about joinder rules and the rule against perpetuity, and I had no idea why I was there. It felt like someone had handed me the federal rules of civil procedure and said, this is your life now. <laughs> and by the way, here is a leaflet with the three jobs you can do with a JD. It didn't help that law school was difficult and I felt terrible at it. Rule 12 seemed like the sort of thing that lawyers cared about, and I did not care at all. I couldn't see the connection between the rules and the people I wanted to help. I couldn't bring myself to give a damn. Enrolling in law school felt like the most uninformed decision I had ever made. And I questioned whether law school would ever be what I wanted it to be. By the end of first quarter, I wanted to leave and get my life and my career possibilities and my goats back. Thank God I didn't. Actually, thank you. Thank you to all the professors, students, and especially my family, who told me to see what the law looks like in the real world before giving up, who told me to seek out those I came here to help before deciding that this wasn't the way to help them. Maybe I didn't want to be a law student, but that didn't mean I didn't want to be a lawyer. Not sure of what I would find or whether I would return, I took a deep breath and stepped out into the world. Part two, how I learned to give a damn. My 1L summer, I accompanied an attorney on a visit to three men in death row in Livingston, Texas. The men were brought in, handcuffed, and placed in steel cages, just big enough for one person, about four feet across and eight feet high, on the other side of a plexiglass barrier. We said hello by placing our palms up to the glass and then grabbed the black plastic phones. All three men were Mexican nationals convicted of murder in Texas. All three men were victims of severe child abuse as a child, and all three men had histories of mental illness and substance abuse. At trial, they did not receive zealous representation. It is offensive to say they received representation at all. During closing argument, his final chance to tell his client's story, one defense attorney had told the jury, I have done everything I can for this man. I hope I haven't offended you. I tried hard with what I had to work with, and it wasn't much. One of the men had been on death row for over 20 years. Given that he had 20 years of legal representation, I figured he might have some insights into the profession. So I asked him, what makes a good attorney? He didn't have to think about it. A good attorney is someone who cares. That's it. A good attorney is someone who cares. That made me think about the state of the legal profession. This man has had a parade of attorneys appointed to his defense. So many of them have not cared about him. So many of them have not cared about whether he lives or dies that all he can hope for, his best case scenario, is an attorney who cares. This was just the beginning of my legal education. Time and again, I found myself meeting people in desperate 
vulnerable places. And time and again, I saw the great unmet need for legal services. Not to put too fine a point on it, but I learned that there are some terrible lawyers out there, and there are some terrible judges out there, and too many people are in prison not because of the heinous nature of their crime, not because they're a danger to society, but because some lawyer or some judge gave up on them, didn't care enough, and more often than not, they were too poor to hire someone to put up a fight. That's what the system looks like. Suddenly, I found myself caring deeply about every seemingly insignificant rule, down to the italicized periods, <laughs> anything that contributed to this. And I remember thinking, this was exactly what I came to law school to learn. Part three, what giving a damn looks like. Once my eyes were open, law school had much to show me, inside and outside of the classroom. At SLS and in the real world, I've met professors and other students who are fighting the good fight with every inch of their soul. They are my role models for the type of attorney and the type of person I want to be. But the most important lesson came earlier this year from one of my clients. I was working on a motion for a habeas case. This case is a grave injustice. My client is serving 30 years to life in prison for allegedly taking $91 from a pizza hut. He was unarmed and no one was injured. As you might know about habeas, it's a procedural minefield. There are a million ways to lose before you can ever get to the merits of the case. We were trying to make our way through one of the minefields, and the law was not good. The more I researched the motion, the more I became convinced we might lose. The week before filing, I went to visit my client. I was nervous to tell him what I thought about our chances. He had always been so optimistic in his letters, he ended every one Give him hell, counselor. But there I was sitting across from him, and he asked me the question, are we going to win? I had to be honest. I told him I really wanted to win, but I didn't know if we would. I tried to pick things up. I said, but you know what? If we lose, and I'm not saying we will, but if we lose, we're still in this. We have some other shots down the line, and I think we can win. Don't worry. We'll play the long game if we have to. And he sighed and said, man, the long game? Every moment the state delays, I'm in prison. So what? We might win someday, but what good will it do me if they grant habeas and release me after 15 years? That night, I stayed up thinking about our conversation, and I rewrote the conclusion to the brief. This time, I didn't reiterate why we should win the procedural argument. I said what was really going on. I said a man is serving a horribly unjust sentence, a man who never received a fair trial, and he has been wasting away in prison for over a decade while the state has tried over and over again to drop him and his constitutional violations through procedural black holes. We won. About a week. About a week later, I opened a letter from my client. I imagined he would be pretty satisfied with the result. Sure enough, the first line read, now that's what I'm talking about, counselor. <laughs> but as I read on, he wasn't saying anything about the decision. He didn't know about the decision. He was responding to the brief. Throughout the letter, he quoted parts of the conclusion like each one was a punch thrown on his behalf. First you said this, and then you went on the attack with that, and that's what I'm talking about, counselor. Reading that letter was hands down the best moment I had in law school. The theme of this speech comes from something Professor Marshall said last year at a talk on the death penalty. He told us to have the courage to give a damn. Before law school, I think I would have asked, why courage? Don't you just give a damn, and that's it? But that's because my principles had never really been tested. That's because I never confronted the very real prospect 
of giving a damn, giving a damn so much that you care about the little things, the font size and the italicized periods, and failing. Looking back because I thought we would lose the motion, because the law was bad, I had unconsciously lowered my expectations for what the system owed my client. I had lowered my expectations for justice. But my client reminded me of what was at stake. He taught me that regardless of the narrow, technical, even hopeless question before the court, a good attorney is someone who cares enough to believe that the system should be better than this, who cares enough to say what's really going on, who cares enough to make others care too. Class of 2014, what I loved about doing all this alongside you is that so many of you care deeply about whatever it is that you fight for. Especially over the last two years in clinic, as we found our footing and our passion and we gave a damn together, it was inspiring. I am grateful to Stanford for this transformative education. We know justice is not naturally occurring, not in this system, but we also know how to demand it. We have the tools, we speak the language, now is our chance. This is our legal system, this is our client's legal system, this is the system of those who don't have a lawyer. Push back against the tendency to narrow the argument into comfortable, innocuous places. Tell the story, the whole story, the difficult story, the human story, and make the system hear those caught within it. Have the courage to give a damn and give him hell a counseling. <laughs>